in the end, a good game with bad monetization is just a bad game. This video is largely inspired by a video from the YouTube channel called The Escapist. They have a video titled, The Current State of Online Multiplayer Games is Embarrassing. And it's a really great video on the state of online gaming in current year in general. And for those of us who have been around since the days of the Xbox 360 or even prior to that, we aren't blinded by nostalgia by saying that gaming, especially online gaming, is absolutely worse nowadays than it was up until roughly 2016. Since then, we've only seen quality, quantity, and stability get worse, and monetization increase exponentially. And for this video, I wanted to take several points made by the Escapist video and apply them to Destiny 2 because it's also changed for the worse right alongside the rest of the industry over the last nearly 10 years now. Now, has it all been bad? No, of course not. Destiny 2 is a good game, but a good game with bad monetization is a bad game. And Destiny 2's monetization is one of the most egregious in the industry. Now some might say that EA or Activision are worse, but I think EA and Activision both could only dream of getting away with the shit that Bungie does. EA and Activision games have battle passes and bundles, and that absolutely sucks for sure. There's nothing I hate more than logging into a game and getting these two things shoved in my face. But Destiny 2 has battle passes and bundles. But on top of that, it also has expansions, dungeon passes, season passes, Eververse ships, shaders, sparrows, emotes, ornaments, $15 armor sets, and holiday event battle passes. And even transmog is monetized. So for as much as I have disdain for games like Call of Duty and Battlefield, their publishers only wish they could milk their players on the level that Bungie does. Now there was a point in time when Bungie used to say that they needed Eververse to sustain the game and even touted that at one point, one weapon ornament, the Whisper of the Worm ornament in particular, was able to fund the Zero Hour Exotic mission. And that mission was then released for free because they already made the money that it cost to create the mission from the microtransaction sale. Yet nowadays, to get access to similar missions, you have to buy the season. And then you'd think that a dungeon that releases during that season would be included in the price, but no, that's also a completely separate purchase. Even though Bungie has released dungeons in the past for free, seemingly funded by the cash shop, or they would be included with expansions or seasons. So it kind of begs the question, does the cash shop fund nothing anymore? It would appear that way on the surface, but I'm sure all this extra monetization is being used to fund Bungie's other projects, which, you know what? Fair enough. Bungie can do whatever they want with their microtransaction money, they're a private company, but I do wish they'd discontinue this facade that increased prices and constant nickel and diming is necessary to support Destiny 2 development because I think we all know that just isn't true when the game's quality and quantity of content has dropped off so far. I mean, reskinning content is at an all-time high and server stability is at an all-time low. Now, I can already see some of the comments, those that will furiously defend Bungie and attempt to justify their actions in recent years, but just remember, Players' best interests maybe make up 10% of the final decision in meetings. The other 90% is all about how to exploit things like your fear of missing out, your addictive tendencies, and figuring out how to increase prices year over year while spending less and less on development. Their profit margins are all that matters and are baked into every decision being made. These things are not at all done for the benefit of the player. So every time you make excuses for things like this, the grins of the big suits at the top grows wider and wider, knowing that even their customers will defend their sleazy business practices. They know they've got the green light to push the envelope a bit further each year. And this is why no company sees the need for change. Going back to Call of Duty for a second, the new Modern Warfare 2 continues to lack in actual content and many bugs and glitches continue to plague the game, but the $30 Black Cell bundle sold so well for Season 3 that they don't feel the need to fix the game when they can just instead make millions by creating microtransactions for clueless normies to buy. And then we go back to Destiny, where expansions and seasons have increased in price each year, despite having less and less content than they used to. So players are literally paying more and more money for less and less content. And if you're a business, why would you spend more money than you have to on creating content if your audience will buy it anyway because they'll buy anything you put out regardless of the quality? This is where we're at with modern gaming, and this is where we're at with Destiny 2 and its community.
I used to be an online only gamer for years. Even with single player games, if they had a multiplayer component, I'd spend more time in there. I was addicted to the social aspect, the competition, and the progression systems. And the progression systems are really what kept me around for ages on a game. Now fast forward to 2017, Fortnite introduced the Battle Pass and people thought it was revolutionary. When to me, all a Battle Pass is, is the progression system of a game being cut out, then sold back to us for $10. And if you played Halo or Call of Duty during their golden age, then you know what I'm talking about. You could earn skins, camos, calling cards, emblems, all sorts of things like that through the actual in-game progression system. This meant doing things like challenges or completing milestones to unlock things, or just simply level up your XP. Usually some sort of combination of all of these. Battle passes are not revolutionary. It's just a gutted feature that's sold as extra with an expiration date that induces FOMO. And in Destiny 1 when I asked someone, where'd you get that? It was almost always tied to some kind of challenge. Oh, this helmet came from farming the Malak Nightfall. Or, oh, this chest piece came from running Archon's Forge over the weekend. Or maybe it was, this shader and ship came from my faction rank up package. But nowadays, whenever I ask anyone where they got something in regards to armor, ships, sparrows, shaders, you name it, it's almost always Eververse, or the Battle Pass. Now Destiny 1 did not have the cash shop for its first year, and it wasn't added to the game until partway through Taken King. And ever since its introduction, I've hated it. As did many players, as microtransactions were new at this time, and the gaming community used to rally against them much harder back then, and Bungie, knowing this, kept Eververse to a minimum. And at the time, the only thing you could really buy were emotes. That's it. Harmless enough, and in fact is the only form of monetization that I actually support, because armor, skins, shaders, sparrows, all of that should be earnable loot. But emotes? Sure, there's a pass. But over time, Bungie would begin slipping in more items to Eververse. And at first it was with the Festival of the Lost loot boxes that would contain consumables like jackalites and bats, but also legendary masks that you would need to spend glue to make permanent items in your inventory. But then with Sparrow Racing League, we'd see Sparrows make its way into Eververse as well. And even a $10 event pass would be first introduced that tracked your stats on various racetracks. The April update pushed things further by inserting armor sets, multiple ships, Sparrows, and even reputation XP boosters inside the Sterling Treasure loot boxes. Taken themed items that should have been rewards from bosses or quests instead ended up inside the loot boxes. And by the time of Rise of Iron and its numerous events post-launch, we'd have more items in Eververse than there realistically should be in a game that's designed around earning cool loot. And that includes cosmetic loot. And it really did harm the looting experience in general because the whales that dropped the cash would end up with all of the good items day one. Uh, we'll spend... We'll drop down 20. Buy silver. Uh, or I could, you know what, fuck it. It's, it's launch day. We'll buy, we'll buy 50 bucks worth. Microtransactions? I know. I pref I'm okay with them. Sorry if you're not. This is your fault. And Destiny 1 by the end of it was already pretty negatively impacted thanks to microtransactions because even though they're just cosmetic, doesn't mean that we don't play to earn cool looking cosmetics. Again, earning cosmetic items like this was the entire progression systems for online gaming during the pre-microtransaction days. But when companies realized they could just sell it instead of make it attached to quests or in-game challenges, why wouldn't they sell it? Of course they're going to sell it to us, because they know there's people dumb enough to buy it. And as we all know, Destiny 2 accelerated this issue when it launched, Eververse was even more egregious with more items than ever before, XP throttling so that players felt forced to buy bright engrams, and the need to spend upwards of tens of thousands of dollars to get all the items in Eververse. Microtransactions are a very slippery slope, and if players don't hold companies accountable and defend them by saying, it's just cosmetic, then this is where we end up. $70? $70 fucking dollars? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Now things continued to be this bad for the entirety of Destiny 2's first year. The cash shop had more loot than the actual game. But Forsaken, Bungie reeled in Eververse a little bit more and introduced the Prismatic Matrix, which was definitely not a perfect solution, but certainly one that players could get behind because it was so much more tame compared to what came before. And the loot game during Forsaken thrived because Bungie put so many of the items in the actual loot pools of the game instead of the cash shop. 
But after earning back players' trust, Bungie would, of course, slowly start introducing more and more items and changes over time to Eververse. And when Bungie split from Activision, it became easier to justify these changes on their end, and fans were defending it because they need the money, as if they're some sort of indie company working out of their parents' basement or something. And where does four years of little to no pushback get you? Right where Eververse sits today. It has the vast majority of loot and vanity items in the game, which has absolutely affected the pursuit of loot in the actual game. If whale number 3012 can on his first day have an exotic sparrow, an exotic ship, and a cooler looking armor than what I can earn in a raid, all because he spent 50 bucks at Eververse, then loot is pretty much meaningless. And the cash shop has become the one and only purpose for any event in the game. Take Guardian Games or Festival of the Lost. These events have us essentially doing the same activities we do any other day of the week, but now there's a bunch of themed items for sale, as well as an event battle pass on top of that, and that's not to mention the increased price for Eververse items across the board. Somehow the Eververse store went from something Bungie needed, to instead being the primary focus for loot that just doesn't fund anything in Destiny 2. And to those that disagree, I would just point you to the fact that the new Trials of Osiris armor set and new playlist armor set that were promised did not come this year, even though they promised, again, at least one armor set per year. That's it. But this year, they're just missing. And it really looks like they've been so busy with Eververse armor sets that they actually forgot to make armor you can earn in the game. So every game company sets out to make a successful video game that makes them money, and that's not a problem because nobody makes a game with the intention of no sales or players, and the way game companies used to compete for customers was by making the best game. The most creative or innovative, the one with the best mechanics and progression systems. But live service games, like Destiny, actively discourage creativity, innovation, or quality content because you need to be fast. Destiny 2's general manager at the time, now CDO Justin Truman, laid this out exactly in a GDC presentation, explaining why being fast at making content is more important than making quality content. Basically the idea that 5 out of 10 content that comes out every 3 months is better than 10 out of 10 content that releases maybe once a year. And how they've deployed this strategy with Destiny 2 since 2019, and it's been very successful for them financially. But financial success does not mean it's a great game. As managers like Justin Truman said, they aren't aiming to be great. They're aiming to be fast. So what does this mean for developers? Well, the creative ones are pushed away or reined in and restrained to prevent over delivery, as Bungie calls it when you actually want to make a quality product. And the only developers left are the ones willing to make design decisions based on data analytics, quarterly projections, CEO ideas, and community feedback, which leads to a mass exodus of players who actually want quality products and leaves the community to be made up of people who willingly partake in the perpetual carrot dangling and constantly shout over each other vying for Bungie's attention to cater to their very specific needs. So what happens is, Destiny 2 stays in a perpetual state of being a 5 out of 10 game, no matter how good things like a new raid or a dungeon or a new subclass ends up being. The game is stuck, focused on fast, over quality. Drip feed content, instead of content drops. And it's hard to be excited for a new season when the day of the release, only two hours of content is available. And I have to wait till next week to play the next hour of content, and the next week for another hour of content, and so on, for the next few weeks. And then it's back to playing the same game we had before the season for two months, till the cycle repeats. And it's funny to me because Bungie's attempts to keep me playing have been the exact reason I stopped playing. Their FOMO tactics, their weekly login, so-called incentives, they do nothing for me anymore because they've gone way across the line. It's barely a game. Like I said in my last video, it's a waiting room where every so often there's 30 minutes of new content. But this isn't just a Destiny issue, so I'll give it that. So many other multiplayer games have a similar problem, which is why I find myself playing more single player games these days. And usually ones pre-2015 because they didn't have microtransactions, unlike a very surprisingly large number of the ones today. Now I do this not because I solely want to play only single player games, but because there is nothing that multiplayer games do for me anymore. They cater to the worst parts of the communities. The communities themselves are generally pretty toxic if you bring up any sort of valid criticism, and the companies charge so much for so little actual content. So I'll answer the question, why don't you play Destiny 2, with another question. Why do you play Destiny 2? Is it because it's fun with friends? Because kicking a soda can down the street 
is fun with friends. To quote the escapist video again, I'm always curious about the excuses people come up with to defend the inexcusable and it's generally been the same. It's more fun with friends. Why don't you see that as a virtue of your friends and not of the game? Is it the story that keeps you playing? If so, I definitely find it hard to relate because Destiny's story quality has never been great, and even its strongest campaigns like Taken King, Forsaken, and Witch Queen have only ever been good. The lore reads like poorly written fanfiction these days, unlike a lot of the lore earlier on, and seasonal stories are mediocre at best. But hey, the cinematics are good at least, so I guess there's that. And to those that might say I'm a Destiny 2 hater, I'll point to the fact that I didn't once knock the game's solid gunplay, the movement, the abilities, the rage, or the dungeon design. Those aspects have always been good, and in fact, continue to stay good, for the most part. Destiny 2 is a good game with awful monetization and live service go-go-go design philosophy that completely destroys the experience for me, and has infected every single aspect of the entire game's design. From a cash shop that has ruined so much of the looting aspect of the game, to increased content prices for less actual content, drip feed time gating of that content to incentivize daily or weekly login, instead of just letting me play at my own pace, and chopping up content like dungeons to be sold separately from seasons or even expansions. And I know I haven't even touched on it too much in this video, but outright neglecting and ruining the game's PvP Crucible mode, as well as the other core playlists. I would play Destiny 2 if Bungie could control themselves and focus on quality over quantity, but they can't and haven't been able to since 2019. And Destiny has never been perfect, and it's always had problems with plenty of examples of greed from 2014 to 2018, but this franchise truly became bad when it went free to play and dove headfirst into becoming one of the largest examples of corporate greed and milking its fan base down to the very last penny, even if it comes at the expense of the game's quality. I didn't change. Gaming did. Destiny did. For the worse. There's a newer excuse that comes up recently, and that's maybe one day the game will have more content. And that sums up what online multiplayer gaming has become in the last decade. A way to dangle carrots forever. 